Now that's fancy. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. I thought we'd check out Carter Vintage today. Just in case you don't know, they have their own exchange. It's kind of like Reverb, where it's mainly their inventory, but other sellers are also allowed to list on their website, as well as individuals. Today's episode's not sponsored by them or anything, I just thought I'd let you know in case you didn't. But here's what stood out to me on their website. Let's kick things off with some nice Les Pauls. So we just recently documented the music rising, but these guys just recently sold a beautiful one. I think they were asking about 7000 for it. It's very very uniformly colored. I can see why somebody ponied up the money. It's got a good flame top underneath that too. And I like the extra wood grain that this backplate has. That one was number 146. Following that up is one of the most beautiful artisans I've seen. I'm not sure if it's just their backdrop, but it's still your regular three-piece top. But there's some good figuring in here. Like, it's not crazy ultra flame top of by modern day standards, but it's got a little bit extra to it. And it's a nice dark tobacco sunburst. It really wasn't that long ago that these artists would sell between 18 to 2500, but I wouldn't mind having one of these in my collection that was in like really clean shape and looked nice like this one. I was tempted to make an offer because the gold seems pretty good. You've got your Sustained Sisters TP6 tailpiece. Trust me, the Moog Electronics, they're not worth paying a premium for, not in their current state. There's just like one or two good settings out of them for the most part. And they might look like customs, but they're honestly not. They're more so like a really souped up standard because the back does not have binding. They wanted to opt for this comfort cut over here and they had to route it all out anyway. But they do have the cool fancy headstock and they came stock with these brass nuts. So for me, the Les Paul Artist is cool only because of the headstock. Other than that, it's just kind of a relic of the past. This one is stamped a second. And ultimately, that's why I didn't pursue this one further. But it wouldn't have surprised me had that one been stamped that way because an employee wanted to take that beautiful one home. But now how about this, an interesting piece from the early 2000s. This is the Diamond Cut Les Paul. I've seen about three of these. There's a really cool flip flop blue and then there's this gold one. We had saw that other one in the Guitar Motel series that we had featured recently. And honestly, 5,000 is not the craziest price for this one. I believe it's actually come down since when it was first listed. It basically just has CNC cutouts that make it kind of look like a honeycomb like effect, just in a parallelogram like shape. But that's the problem, it ends up looking like a studio that has a standards neck on it. So maybe not the Les Paul for everyone, but it has its place in history. The back of it is just completely black. And I can confirm, 2003. And not a Les Paul, but a very interesting prototype from 2017. They call it a Solid Form 5, 16 inch. So the way I interpret that is this is supposed to be like a Gibson L5, but it's a double cutaway design, and then it had a solid mahogany back, rather than their usual press forming. Look at that headstock, you got the old style, the Gibson. But flipping over to the back, it appears I was right. So it's kind of like the Midtown series, but I would assume this came out of the custom shop because usually the custom shops get handwritten serial numbers when they're prototypes like that. Now it's listed at 9,000 and I'm not really interested in this style of guitar, but it is fascinating what the custom shop was playing around with. That's why I like checking out Carter Vintage because you just never know what you're going to find because a lot of times it's Gibson employees that bought things that can sign with them. So they get some good stuff. We've got one of the cool SG specials from the early 70s. I'm a big fan of the early 70s SGs because it was the first versions that I had experience with and they're just fun. They're nowhere near specked out like the 60s ones, but that doesn't make them not cool. So the special actually has these mini humbuckers here, which you don't find equipped on an SG every day. But you'll also notice that it does not have binding. A lot of times these will have gotten routed out for humbuckers and then they get mislisted as standards. But the SG standard was only offered in bound rosewood and unbound ebony fretboards. So keep your eye out on that. If you find an unbound rosewood standard, it most likely started life as one of these specials. But cool to see one still with an ABR1 bridge. It looks like somebody's put an aftermarket pick guard on it. Swapped out our switch tip, but we've got our original knobs. Interesting three-piece body. That stock's looking pretty okay. Top of our truss rod covers chipped though. But oh, all these get broken. That almost looks like it could be a scratch though. But nope, confirmed repair. And they're asking 3600 That one seems kind of high to me. But also staying within the 70s, here's an E2 Explorer. I know we've been talking about these off and on. And someone teased me. They agreed to sell me one of these and another cool guitar, and then they backed out at the last second. So we almost got the review and demo of one of these. But I honestly really enjoy this one. It's got a lot of cool figuring wood grain right here that you don't always see on them, and a lot of just regular circular grain. But what's kind of interesting about this one is there's a harmonica bridge, and it's like extra slanted. Typically 
typically these just have the regular bridges. I would assume that was put on after the fact, but at least we still have the TP6. But this one was definitely played. It's got a nice worn vibe, but we still have the original Dirty Fingers pickups. The headstock is nice and ambered over. But here's where the fun starts. Authentic buckle worming in Rash. But the back almost looks like Brazilian rosewood. They used really nice pieces of walnut on this. That's all I've got to say. It really reminds me of my Yeti Les Paul Custom or some of the other crazier Brazilian top guitars I've had. But what's even more is look at that neck. Someone has sanded the finish off of it. You don't see that every day. But they left the finish alone right here. But it's always really cool to me to see these late 70s versions because most people associate the E2s and V2s with 1980, but they did actually launch in the late 70s. And for whatever reason, explorers of that era have a very different serial number font set. I don't know if I'd call this one quite stage four vibes, but it is kind of cool. But next up, they had this V2. So normally they look like this with the boomerang pickups. But in 1982, to help sell through the rest of the models, they produced a humbucker version. Now, how do you tell somebody hasn't just modified one? A lot of times they're in this candy apple red finish. And you need to look at your fretboard right here. Ones that initially had the boomerang pickups will have a cutout there. So if you have an area of your fretboard missing in humbucker pickups, you know somebody's routed it. Otherwise, it is the same. I like how they captured it in this photo, the center stripe of whatever it is, because it's either going to be a maple or a walnut stripe, depending on which configuration this one started life as before it was painted over. But as far as our condition, we've got some scratches back here. This shows us this is the silver base coat candy apple red, not one of the early ones with the gold base coat. And somebody swapped out our tuners. But now let's get on to the expensive Epiphones. So here is a $2,000 Epiphone Joe Bonamassa Treasure Firebird 1. I think that's crazy. If you actually go to Reverb, there are other sellers asking that for that particular year and color run. And these Epiphones are really well respected. But price aside, I just wanted to share this one because it's beautiful. You've got the figuring in the mahogany on that side. You have some within your centerpiece of the body, a little bit of ringage over there. This photo helps demonstrate that even further. But then you can see the continuation of the figuring back here. Interestingly enough, it no longer says Epiphone on it. Trying to hide that fact, I think. Your serial number and decal signature definitely give it away, but look at that. Vintage style tuners on there. That's why those sell for so much. It's a lot more accurate than Gibson USA has been producing within the past like 10-ish years. And it looks like somebody's upgraded our pickup and made some other modifications to it. So a niche buyer pool for that one for sure, but it's cool. And along similar lines, this is a 2009 Epiphone ES125 George Thorogood Custom. Now, unfortunately, I do not see any description on this one. And I'm only personally familiar with his Epiphone White Fang that they did a couple of years back. And those certainly don't cost 4000 so what's our story here? Well, let's take a look at it first. Jet black finish, dual dog ear P90 pickups. You've got the whiskey style knobs, black and gold combination with a chrome tailpiece, floating bridge design ambered over binding with the Florentine cutaway. It almost made me think this was a USA produced one, but then you get to the headstock, you see the three screw truss rod cover. Oh, that's interesting. Back plates. <laughs> think you got enough screws? Going ES333 in style. Dunlop strap locks on it. Then we have George Thorogood's signature that just appears to be a decal, your regular custom shop Epiphone. And then I would have thought that meant 2018, but this appears to maybe have been some sort of a prototype that didn't quite make it to production like his white one. But if you're interested further, I'm sure you can contact them. Maybe they have more of a story to it. It does look incredibly good for an Epiphone though. It's nailed that vintage vibe. Whereas the white one looks more hot rodded. So it just kind of depends what you're going for. But now I'm curious, did these have back plates? By golly, they did. <laughs> I might need to review one of those. And they stuck with the million screws, okay. But how about this one from 1976? It's an ES-345 that has been heavily modified. So we've got knobs all over the place. It would have started with this one, that one, that, that, and the output jack. So that means we've got two knobs added in this location and right there, and then three mini splits here, there, and here. And then we've got one of those Stars guitars style bridges that Kirk Hammett likes to use. And then we've got some sort of a fancy tailpiece. It looks like the pickups in general have just been replaced, and then we've got these unique rim covers over top of it. It pairs really well with this dark wine red finish. So apparently there's your regular two volumes and two tones with your toggle switch, but then we have a mini toggle as a three-way on-off switch, and then a two-way boost switch, 
and then a two-way coil split switch with an additional master volume. And then one of these knobs, I would assume this one might be a six-way veritone. And all that's wired up in stereo. Which are these old guitars, you can modify them and have a great time all you want, right? But what's truly impressive about this is the fact that it's an ES345. You don't have back plates to do all this. You have to wire it up outside of the guitar, then hopefully try to fish it through here and get everything to the spot that it's supposed to be. I gotta check the back, make sure they didn't add a control cavity. Wow, I'm impressed. Only a small one, and it's probably just for a 9-volt battery would be my guess. So reading our description, this was done by Ron Armstrong, who worked with Alembic and at Stars Guitars. So that makes sense why we have these things there. What a fascinating piece. They're asking 7,000 on it. But now check out the 62SG. It's a special, left-handed, and has a weird vibrola system on it. It reminds me a lot of the new Sheraton that we had just reviewed. Slightly different. You don't see that every day. Apparently the Vibrola is not all that good, it's not currently strung up with it, but hey, it's cruise control for cool. So that probably means that was added after the fact would be my best guess. But this appears to be exceptionally clean, it wasn't played that much. They're asking eight and a half thousand, that is a nice piece, but this one's offered by Guitars West. But now let's give the basses some love. Here's a 59 EB2. Once upon a time, Gibson made 335 basses, essentially. That's what the EB2 is. But this one's an awesome natural finish, and it's got all the checking. And check out your back. It was definitely played, you can tell in that area. Looks like at least one replaced knob on it. And still just your one mud bucker. Ah, oh, what is this? They messed with our tuners. Little banjo style. Looks like you got a little bit of flame figuring in your neck, too. Cool. But if one mud bucker's not enough, how about a 64 that has the mini humbucker in the bridge too? But this one is a lot cheaper at 2500 because somebody put a skyburst finish on it. It doesn't look like the highest quality refinish, but I like the color scheme, especially with our white knobs and your purple strings. But this is my favorite thing. When people refinish old guitars, I like it when they at least leave the headstock alone because it just transforms the identity too much when you make that look new too. So even if it is a little bit beaten and tattered, sometimes it's a better idea just to leave it that way. But ah, these guys cheaped out. They had to cut a control plate out of the back. And they sank a strap button right there. All right, troglodytes, I think that's enough guitar hunting for tonight. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.